So what you do, uh, type this command uh, wherever. So type ls to get the listing, and you'll have your Linux tutorial tar.gz. And then the command that you want to type is tar xdf. And then Linux uh, tutorial tar.gz. And it should expire. You can use tab to uh, automatically complete the file. Okay, hands up if you have the files directed. Okay. And are you part of this also? Do you have it directed about And are you part are you doing the tutorial? No, okay. So just a five? Is that? Um, that's the this one? Mm -hmm. yeah, I should be able to uh, switch up the light. It's supposed to be this guy, but then... Okay, so people who are just showing up uh, that want to follow along with the tutorial uh, have all the files and the commands uh, uh, available, so just follow these instructions. Open up uh, 
terminal. So I guess the first thing is, uh, I guess everybody knows how to open up a terminal. If you don't, uh, click on this little uh, button in the top left corner. Just type T for terminal, and it should bring up. You might have to type more. Okay, so to start off, um, so the basic Unix philosophy is to write uh, a program that just does one thing and have it do it well. And so the Linux commands are essentially, you think of them as just a whole bunch of uh, miniature programs. And so you get, do a lot of, uh, they have a lot of programs to do text manipulation, uh, reversing file structures, uh, and the directory structure. Uh, so to get things started, we'll assume that everybody has some basic knowledge. And so the cd command is to change the directory. Uh, so uh, the root directory, like the very basic directory structure, uh, you don't have drive names in Linux like you do in Windows. So in Windows they have drive names, but in uh, Linux everything starts off from the root directory and the root is uh, starts off with forward slash. And all your disk drives, they'll be mounted as uh, that they get mapped to like a specific folder or to a specific uh, media device. And so this is uh, the root directory. Uh, to get a listing, you type ls, and so this is the equivalent of the dir command in Windows. And you can just see how uh, most of the stuff uh, for your own personal files are located in the home directory. And so if you did like get ls uh, home, uh, it brings up like all the users that have ever logged into this computer. Uh, the other thing about Linux is you can use tab to like complete. Um, it'll try to automatically figure out what command you're trying to type or what uh, directory you're trying to get into. Uh, your home directory has a shortcut. So if you ever get lost and you need to get back to your home directory where all your files are located, uh, you do the, the tilde button. Uh, it's in the top left. And this will bring you to your home. And so you notice how I have um, a little tilde there. That means I'm in my directory. Um, just one thing is, if you ever want to know where you are in the directory structure, you can type pwd, and that tells you your present working directory. And so it says I'm in slash home slash mraw. Uh, like in Windows, um, uh, the single dot means the current directory that you're in, and two dots means your previous directory. So if I wanted to go up one level, I can do cd dot dot, and it brings me to the parent directory. Um, so we have uh, commands to, um, let's see, so we covered these three. So there's the copy command, uh, the move command, and the remove command. Uh, they work just the same way as Windows uh, for the most part. Uh, I'm going to skip over those since those are fairly uh, basic uh, commands. Uh, does anybody want me to cover them at all? And again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask. So uh, now we are in this. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so you can extract the files. Yeah. And then just uh, open up a terminal and go to that uh, directory that the files are located in. Yeah. Sorry, I always got, so execute this command here, tar xvf. Okay, 
So So LS uh, gives you the listing of what's in your um, uh, the files that are available in the current directory. Uh, you can do pattern match. You can do like LS start on txt, and it'll list all the files that uh, match uh, .txt. Uh, if you want more information about the files, you can do LS A. Um, actually, sorry, uh, ls a actually shows you the hidden files. Uh, so it shows you all the files. So in, in Unix, uh, if a file name or directory starts with a dot, uh, it implies that it's, a, it's a, um, like a hidden file and it normally doesn't show up. So in here, there's, um, I have the current directory and the previous directory, those are just shortcuts. Uh, but then there's a few hidden files that have been made by like various text editor programs, so like the dot uh, underscore print k. It's, it's a backup file that one of the text editors has made for this file here. And same thing with uh, this dot pound Linux tutorial dot org. These are uh, just hidden files that uh, are just sort of like not really garbage, but they shouldn't show up. It just makes a lot of clutter. Uh, if you want more information about the files, you can do ls-l, and it'll give you, um, so this first column here uh, are the permissions. And so there's three types of permissions. Uh, there's uh, group permissions, um, your user permissions, and then permissions for everybody. Uh, I forget which order there are, but essentially, um, you have uh, read, so it's available to be read, version, execute. So you have read, write, and execute uh, possibility. So I think this first one, this first column here, this is for the user, uh, since this is my own directory. And so I have uh, read, write, and execute permission for everything. And I think the middle one might be group. I could be wrong. OK, yeah. Yeah, so uh, I'm not a complete expert, so if anybody uh, knows something that I don't, uh, feel free to speak up. I don't get offended. Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. But essentially, this is what all this means. And then the D specifies if it's a directory or not. Uh, I forget what this column here means. Uh, does anybody know what this column here means? Yeah, it's all the ones in the I'm not too sure. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'll give you a quick sound. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, and then you have uh, the, the user, uh, which group they belong to, and then uh, the file size. And this file size here is in bytes. Uh, but reading file sizes in bytes is a bit hard. So what you can do is you can do, okay, and uh, one of the shortcuts is if you press the up button, it'll bring up your last command. And so it just makes it easier if you want to attack something on it. So if you do ls.lh, the h flag uh, makes it so it's human readable, and it converts all the bytes into like kilobytes or megabytes or gigabytes. So you have k for kilo, and m for mega, and g for giga. Uh, and then if you wanted to sort the files uh, based on um, on the most recently used, so you can say that you want to sort by the timestamps, and it will just rearrange the listing to be uh, in the order of, uh, I think, when they're last modified. Uh, so some of the things that you can find out about your file sy system is you can check how much uh, free space you have, which is handy. So if you type DF, uh, that stands for disk free, and it uh, tells you how many um, kilobytes you have uh, on each of the uh, devices that are mounted. And again, if you don't like reading bytes, you can do uh, df-h to make it human readable. And it now lists in gigabytes and megabytes, which is a lot easier to understand. Uh, another useful command is if you have a lot of files that are taking up space on your system, you can find out uh, your disk usage, so du. And then you can just give it a star to say, I want the disk usage in the current directory for everything. Uh, let's make this a little bit bigger. Yeah, go ahead. We were talking about storage. 
Yeah, sorting the, the file list is like when you do the ls command, uh, you can add the dash t flag, and I think the r makes it reverse time. Yeah, there's quite a lot. U is the last one you found was accessed. Yeah. So I have this uh, uh, disk usage, and again, it's in it's in uh, bytes. And so I can uh, make it more human readable uh, by adding that each flag and it converting it to it give me like better units. Uh, but at least like absolutely everything, like in all the subdirectories, uh, every single file. If I want a summary of um, just at the current directory level, so let's just say I wanted to know how much uh, like each of these subdirectories we're using. Um, do du dash uh, uh, yeah. uh, so s will give me a summary and so then uh, it'll tell me like how much uh, each subdirectory is, is taking up Let's say you're trying to find a file. Uh, it's fairly easy now, uh, like if you're using desktop, they have like a, uh, if you're using a GUI, uh, they give a lot of uh, handy uh, ways of finding files uh, with search bars. But if you're on the command line, if you need to find a file, uh, they have a find command. And so, uh, so I just created like this, this uh, mock directory structure, like deep dir and there's uh, some files in here that we want to find, and we don't really know where they are. And so let, let's say, and let's say you have like multiple copies of this, of this uh, foo.txt. It could be like a readme that you're looking for. Uh, so if you go back to the root directory or of like the Linux tutorial, and let's say we want to find this file, and so we want to find in the directory uh, deep dir. We want to find all the files or directories that are named foo.txt. And it will give us everything here. Uh, however, uh, <coughs> one of the tricky things about the Lungs file names is um, is you can have dots in your in your folder names. And so if you have files and folders that have uh, the same name, uh, then, uh, like one of these uh, foo.txts is actually a directory, and we want to know which one it is. And so you can give uh, this command another parameter, say uh, type d for directory, and I'll say, uh, well, this foo.txt is actually a directory and it's not a file. And if we want to change that to um, uh, to just only show the files, uh, but not directories. You can give type F for file, and it'll just list all the files. So you notice how here dir deep uh, dir uh, deep dir dir two foo dot txt uh, it doesn't show up in this list. Uh, so in the name here, uh, you can actually use. Uh, just do people know what regular expressions are? It's like pattern matching. So like a very simple one, again, it was with the ls command. Uh, you can do very complicated searches, but a very simple one is if we just did star.txt. It gives us the exact same thing. I should have made some different files. So um, you have to know the location, right? Yeah. 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 Oh, this is only if you want to limit it to like a certain branch. Otherwise, you, you can give it like the root. Like if I did find starting at the root, it would, but it's going to search everything, and it's going to take a long time. But if you have like an idea of, it's I know it's somewhere within this subdirectory, but I don't know which subfolder it's in, then it, it's actually a lot faster to do it that way, rather than doing a complete system search. And so it's like doing the searching on demand. Like it doesn't, I don't know how to build up like build up tables the way that some other fine programs do it, like uh, uh, with Spotlight for Mac. Find okay, so that's like basic file navigation. If you ever need to know um, 
find out more about commands, uh, there's the man uh, for manual. So you can just type man and then any um, uh, man that you give it. So find, so let's say man find. It'll start giving us like um, all the different options for and you can go through. And if you're stuck in the screen, just press Q to get out. So let's go on to working with the text files. Okay, so 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 in this directory here, uh, we have a few text files. Uh, I actually have uh, uh, the book *Pride and Just Pride and Prejudice* by Jane Austen. So that's JaneAusten.txt. And if we just wanted to take a peek of it, uh, we can type head and then Jane Austen, and it'll give us the first few lines of, of this text file. I forget how many is default, maybe 10 or so. Uh, you can change how many lines um, it'll give uh, by doing head-n, and you can specify, uh, say if you want the first 15 lines, and it'll give us some more lines. Uh, Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And then if you wanted the last few lines, you can do tail. So head and tail. You can do Jane Austen and dot txt. Um, and so this gives you the very last one. And same way, you can specify the number of lines that you want. Uh, and Let's say if you actually wanted to navigate it a bit further, you can type more uh, Jane Austen TXT. And what more does is it goes through the file page by page. And so if you hit space, it'll take you to the next page. Uh, the problem with more is you can't go back. You can't go up and you have to traverse uh, page by page. Um, an alternative to more is uh, less. Okay, and if you're stuck in the screen, press Q to, to exit. So if you do less uh, Jane Austen .txt, uh you'll find that you can actually use the arrows and can move up and down line by line. You can still use uh, space to go up, uh, um, go page by page. But the the main thing with when you use the less command is you can actually go backwards and you can actually traverse uh, by line. Um, so some handy utilities is you have word count. So if you do word count Jane Austen .txt, uh, the first uh, it's actually going to spit out four pieces of information. The first uh, piece of information is uh, the number of lines in that file, and it's delimited by a new line character. Uh, the next is the number of words uh, separated by a space, uh, and then the last one is the number of characters. And, but if you only want to, to know the number of, say, lines in the file, you can do word count dash L to give us the number of lines, or word count dash W to give us the, the number of words. <coughs> I wonder if word count dash C gives the number of characters. Yeah, word count dash C gives the number of characters. And I believe the number of characters does include white space. <coughs> I'm not entirely too sure. Uh, you'd have to look at the manual to, to figure it out. Uh, so that's word counting. Uh, so let's take a quick look at a.txt and b.txt. So <coughs> just more a more a txt and more b txt. So I made these files. They're sort of similar. There is a difference between them. And so if you wanted to know the difference uh, between these two text files, uh, there's a difference in that. Diff you just type a txt or b txt. And it'll tell you that there's a difference at that line. Uh, this is actually how uh, a lot of people do uh, source control. Like if you have a lot of people working on projects and you have a lot of source code files and you need to figure out what's the difference between these two source code files, the person's modified them, and you actually want to make the modifications yourself. So what people will do 
uh, is they'll take the difference between the two source files and then they'll just send the difference um, to the person that they want or you just get the difference and then you can apply uh, these changes to your file. So there's actually another utility called patch that will take the output of, of uh, this difference program and apply the changes to, uh, to the file. Uh, we won't actually go into that, but if you want, you can ask me later on about how to use that. Uh, to be honest, I'm not too sure. I think it indicates like the line number, so it starts at uh, line two and starts at three. I don't really know how to interpret these ones. I, I don't really use the diff command too, too much, but. And then it, the page it, it'll tell you a lot more in detail about the kind of things he's talking about. Like, yeah. you're scratching the surface of a lot of the commands. Read the map page find and dip. Great options that are all described in here. Yeah, I just wanted to try to cover some of uh, uh just give like a brief overview. So yes. I, I don't want to go into too much more, detail. Read the man yeah. Page, right? yeah, yeah, read the map page if you want more. If you want more. Uh, so that's the difference. Uh, so let's take a look at um Cat example one, and I take a look at cat example two and cat example three. Okay. And so let's say we want to combine uh, all these three outputs like uh, from end to end. Uh, what we can do is we can take cat for caffeinate, uh, the cat example, and we want to take all these files and just join them end to end. And it's just going to take uh, all these three files and do one, two, three. Um, now, the opposite of concatenate is splitting. And so this is uh, what people had to uh, do back in the day when you only had uh, floppy disks that could only hold one megabyte of data. And if you had a file that was 20 or 30 megabytes, it, it won't fit on a one megabit floppy disk. And so what they would have to do is they'd have to split the file apart. And so I have... So I have uh, a real cat. Uh, so let's take a look. So here's a picture of a real cat. So this is actually a binary file. But we can use this split command uh, to say we want to uh, split uh, the kitten, capital K, uh, and we want to split it up into five kilobyte chunks. Oops, sorry, I have the order. I don't know what the order. Flip dash B, 5K, so B is, is for bytes. You can actually also specify like by line numbers or characters, possibly, if you're working with text. So if you have a text file um, and you want to split up into like equal number of lines, approximately, uh, for to process with some other program, then you can use uh, split and split by the number of lines. Uh, and I'm going to use this uh, dash D flag to uh, give me like decimal increments because it's going to split up into multiple files. I want the end of the file to be like numeric uh, numbers. Uh, the default is to use alphabetic, so it will be like part A, part B, part C. And then uh, the last argument is we have to give it like what to call uh, these multiple files. So I'm going to call it like K split and then part. And it's going to take this. Uh, this uh, last argument as uh, the suffix, and it's going to just start appending like one, two, three to the end, uh, as many as it needs. Oops. Oops, sorry, I forgot to give it the uh, oops, kitten. Uh, first, you have to get the file name that you want to split, and then uh, the suffix, or sorry, prefix. Okay. So if I, now I have to do an ls. See that I have k split part 0, 1, 2, 3, all the way to 4. And if I do an ls dash, do ls, oh, ls dash, lh, k split star. Okay. And you can see that all of them are 5 kilobytes except for the very last one. Okay. Now, Again, uh, there's really no difference between text and just uh, raw data. 
And so what we can actually do is we can join up this file again. Uh, you can actually go to your file, you can actually see, you can actually interpret, yeah, because it's JPEG and it's, um, and it does like streaming for the web, you actually get like one fifth of the, of the cap in the, in the very first plot. I don't know if it can interpret the rest. It, it doesn't, it can't really interpret the rest one. But what we can do is we can use uh, the cat again. And we're going to rejoin, uh, let's see, case split, case split. We'll just say all of them because all of them. And so we're going to introduce uh, something new, and this is called file redirection. So if you remember before when we did uh, the, the one, two, three, it just printed it out the screen. But we don't want to print the binary out the screen, we want to have it written to disk. So if you use the right arrow, um, it tells us to just take this output and put it into a file. And so we're going to call this file kitten2.jpg. And if you look here, here's our, this was our original file, kitten, and this is kitten2, exact same file. And so when you split and join, it still has a uh, Still, it's still the same. Okay. So this is handy, like if you have like a, a multi gigabyte file and you need to split it up because you need to, uh, I don't know, make it easier for downloading or you want to put it onto DVDs, uh, you can use this command to do it. Yeah. This command doesn't work on the machine. It says Okay, uh, you can just drop the dash D. It, it's an optional one just to name them uh, to have a numerical name. Does that work? I didn't try all these on a Mac. Most of them will work on the Mac, but there's a there's a few subtle differences between the Mac commands and uh, the Linux commands in, in how they're implemented. Uh, so let's go on to our next example. Um, columns. So let's just take a look at this columns.txt. And so this is a file and it has five columns in it and it's separated by tabs. And sometimes if you're running experiments you'll have data files like this but you only want like a couple of columns of your data or let's say you're working with a, with a log file. And so there's this command called cut to cut out a column. And you have to specify um, uh, which uh, columns you want. And so F for field. And you can say that I want F1 for the first column. And give it the following. Uh, you can specify multiple columns. So uh, separated by a comma. So if I want F1 uh, and 4, it'll give me columns 1 and 4. You can also give it a range. If I want columns, say, two to four, uh, you separate it with a dash. Okay. And I think it's, so I don't know, I don't think it reorders, no, it doesn't reorder them. So this is a handy command if you, if you know that it's, uh, you only want a certain column of the data, but you're giving this other one that has a whole bunch of uh, columns that you don't want. Uh, one of the reasons why you do this over, say, using Excel is if you had a really, really large file, and like if you had a 200 or 500 megabyte, megabyte data file and trying to load it into Excel and deleting the column, it, it actually takes a, a fairly long time. And if you have like a gigabyte file or multi-gigabyte files, it's almost impossible. It just, the file loading just takes too long. Uh, and so this will work. Uh, so this file has to be uh, tab separated, but it can be comma separated or space separated. Uh, I think it, it sort of intelligently tries to figure it out, uh, what you want to separate the columns by. But if, um, if it has trouble finding out, you can manually specify what you want uh, your delimiter to be between the columns. And you can use the dash, dash uh, D option. So I can do dash D, and then because it's a tab, I think I have to escape it. Yeah, I'm not going to try. Let's try. Okay. Um, it 
have to look at it a bit more, but uh, you're able to specify your own delimiters. Uh, any questions at all? I'll use uh, head. Uh, or there's another one. Uh, can you use set like a st streaming editor? Um, yeah. But what you could do, um, like wh let's say, if I wanted you really quick, um, it's hard to say that you want. Let's say if you want the second column. So I uh, do head dash n two to get the first two lines of columns. Uh, and then I pass it to tail, and I, I want only one line, and that would give me the second one. So I pass it through head first, and then pass it through tail. It's not the most efficient way of doing it if you had a large file, but it's one of the ways that you can do it. Uh, we'll go over what this means uh, later on, uh, to take output from one command and feed it into uh, as input for another command. Uh, probably said would be your best choice if you just want one. Uh, I was just uh, in, the, um, in the file browser. So you can type your name to give uh, the name of your operating system its limits. And so if you do it on OS X, I think it should say Darwin or also work on Solaris or Unix. If you need more information, do you name dash A. Sometimes you need to know if your computer is 64 bit or 32 bit. So uh, I36 So you can get the kernel number tell from this if it's 32 or 64. You name dash P. Uh, on mine, it, it, it tells me in the kernel uh, if it's a 64-bit kernel, like on my other machine. Uh, but yeah, you can look at them. This is what you would use to find out uh, you name. Uh, if you want to know about yourself, you can do who am I. Uh, that's sort of pointless. There's probably other commands. Like, I think you can figure out your, um, your actual like uh, Unix ID number. Uh, and sometimes you actually need that for searching operations. Uh, one of the things that uh, some people need to do is, is sometimes you'll have multiple versions of a program installed on your computer and so you can have like multiple versions of GCC and then on your startup parameter you'll tell it what version to use but when you're actually in your environment you don't know which one you're running and so you can type uh, which uh, say GCC you can also just ask GCC itself but it'll give you like the full path of uh, where the binary uh, is located for that command Uh, if you want some stats about your machine, like how long since your last reboot. 
uh, you can do uptime. And so this computer, I rebooted it 47 minutes ago. Uh, it's nice to do on a Mac, but I'll have enough time for like three or four months with Elder Reboot, which is why it's good to have uh, a Mac. <laughs> um, so you can also time events. Uh, so if you want time, like how long an operation is taking, especially if you have a long running one, you can just do time. And so let's just say, how long does sleeping for half a second take? And it says it's going to take about a half a second to go to sleep. Uh, sleep is just like a command if, if you want to uh, take a pause. Uh, yeah, so. You want like this file that I'm looking at? Yeah, it's called uh, Linux Tutorial .org. It's it, it's in this file here. Uh, Linux Tutorial .org. Yeah, so if you just want to copy, like all the all the instructions I have up in here, they're in that file that I'm uh, looking at. Uh, so sometimes when you're doing uh, systems engineering, uh, you need to know a lot of information about your processor uh, or the machine that you're on. Like, you're not always going to have physical access to the machine, or sometimes you forget what's inside uh, your processor. So you can do. Uh, uh, there's a special file uh, called uh, pro, uh, proc slash CPU info. And this actually gives a lot of information about the machine, like who's made by, the model number, how much cash there is. And they'll actually do it for like each core, so it <coughs> only looks like it has one core, but you'll get one of these listings for every core, so if you have a quad core, you'll have four of those listings. If you need to uh, know your IP address, uh, a quick way of finding that out is uh, ifconfig. So this is the IP address of this machine. Uh, one four two five I think you have to install to get the trace from. Okay. But yeah, it's not installed. Uh, but let's do ping first. So if you're on the internet, you don't need to know the response time to a certain server. You can do ping www.google.com and gives you your response time. And this will keep on going until you hit Control C. So hit Control C to stop. It'll give you your uh, statistics uh, over that. Uh, what TraceRoute does, uh, if you have it installed, uh, it will tell you all the intermediate uh, nodes that it had to traverse to get to a particular destination. Uh, the who is command will give you information about a, a certain IP address or domain. You can say who is google.com. And it gives you, uh, I forget who hosts all this information, but you can like get who registered that IP address, uh, which IP ranges they have. This is a fun little thing to, to look up. Uh, you can tell, so if you get an email from somebody, uh, or if you know somebody's uh, IP address, you can figure out uh, which server they're, or which uh, network provider they're with, you can figure out if they're with TELUS or or with Rogers or uh, Shaw. Uh, okay, so some other useful things. If you want a calendar, you can bring up uh, Cal, bring up a calendar in Linux. Uh, you can get a uh, date, it gives you the date. Uh, and so something that's useful if you work in the command line a lot, and if you have, sometimes you have to type out these really, really long commands. Uh, and then you need to execute it again, like 10 commands later. Uh, what you can do is you can do something called, uh, well first let's just go do the history command, history. And it gives you a uh, history of uh, your last commands. Yeah, that you did. Um, what you can also do is to execute the very last command, is you can hit, uh, there's a shortcut, uh, two exclamation marks, uh, and that'll execute the last command. And it's just going to bring up the same thing. Let's do ls. And if I do this again, it executes another ls. Uh, so if people who know about like administrative accesses, um, 
like sometimes you'll need to use this command sudo to do something under uh, privileged mode. And what happens sometimes is you'll type out this really long command and then it says not authorized. And so you don't want to type sudo and then the whole thing over again. So let's say you had, you had just typed a really long command and then it came back with an error because it says you don't have access. What you can do is instead of typing the whole thing over again, just type sudo and then the two exclamation marks and it'll execute the very last command with uh, with uh, administrator privileges. Uh, another useful ha one is uh, reverse search. Uh, let's say uh, it's not the very last command. It, you don't know how long ago you, you did it. If you type control R, um, let's say uh, that uh, split command that we did a long time ago. I just start typing split. Okay, uh, and there's my split command. And then uh, it'll just bring it up. I can modify it again if I use uh, arrows or if I hit enter, it'll um, it'll execute that command again. Uh, and then if there's multiple matches, uh, so let's do that again. Control R and uh, say cat. And if I hit control R again, it'll cycle through backwards in my history for all the matches that match cat. And if I hold control shift R, uh, I don't know which one is it. Uh, I forget now. There's a way to go forward. Uh, I usually only go backwards. But uh, there's a way to go backwards in history and forward. Uh, I thought it was shift, but it doesn't seem to be working. Okay, so I already showed you before about uh, we had this command where you redirect your output to uh, a file on the disk. Uh, so let's just do a quick example where you take the ls command and instead of displaying the contents of the uh, to the screen, you're going to have it written to disk. Uh, so ls.txt and do more ls.txt more ls.txt uh, it gives us uh, the listings. Um, so let's so if you use two arrows so one arrow will uh, create a new file if it doesn't exist but it will overwrite the file. If you use two arrows it'll add uh, the new contents to the very end. And so let's say let's say we want to append a calendar to the end of that, that ls.txt. So if we use two ar arrows, and then if we say, um, uh, we see that there's a calendar at the end. Uh, let's Okay, so I made this short little program just to print like the first 10 characters, or, or it gives gives an arg argument. So you have to do uh, dash forward slash print k s h, and then give it a number, and it'll just print numbers from like one to 10, uh, or however many that you want. And so what we can do is uh, we can redirect this output to another program like word count. So instead of giving uh, a word count of file to do a word count on. It's, we're going to say we're going to do a word count of whatever we feed it to. <coughs> and so this is called uh, this, like using uh, standard like standard input and standard output. So if you've ever if you ever seen like if you write C plus plus programs, you write std c out or std c in. So uh, it gets redirected to these like input and output uh, streams. Uh, so if you word count dash L, it just says, yes, we have 10 lines. Uh, so another useful way is, let's say you have something that's going to make a lot of output. Mm -hmm. You just want to see, um, see what's at the beginning. Uh, uh, one thing to note about this is uh, when this program here terminates, uh, in some operating systems, it'll cause this pipe to be broken because uh, this program's terminated, this pipe is still getting information into it, but there's nothing on the other side to receive it. And so what will happen is uh, sometimes it'll terminate this program early, and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it depends on your 
depends on how things are configured. Uh, I'm not entirely too sure of the details, uh, but normally I found that most of the time it'll, it'll kill this program uh, once uh, the thing that receives information stops running. Uh, so one of the common use cases that I have for this is uh, I run some experiments and it generates a huge amount of output. And I don't want, I want to save the output, but I don't want to save it to the screen. And it's also so big that I don't want to save it directly to a file. And so one of the things that I can do is I can uh, redirect this output to gzoom. And I give it the command dash C to uh, compress. And so as it's putting out the output, it's going to be fed into gzoom. And it's going to compress it on the fly. And then I'm going to have a write to disk. Uh, so uh, let's say I'm going to do uh, 100,000 lines. And so 100k dot txt.gz. Okay. okay. So I have all this output and it's in this text file. Now, you guys may have come across this yourself where you have this large uh, compressed text file or you have a large compressed file, but now you sort of want to see what's inside. You don't, you just want a preview just to see like what the first few lines are. And if, if it's multi gigabytes large, if you try to open up in like an unarchive or uh, it takes forever, uh, but you only want to know like what the first few lines are. And so there's this other uh, command called zcat. It's like the cat command, but it works with compressed file. So you can do zcat, give it this compressed file, and this will uncompress the file. You probably don't want to uh, have all of it displayed to the screen. But instead, you can pipe it to uh, the command, and it'll give you a sneak peek. And so you don't actually have to wait. Like imagine this was a 200 gigabyte in size. You don't want to decompress 200 gigabytes. Uh, you might not even have the, the space to decompress it all. Uh, but here you can just do it on the fly and then extract the information that you need. Yeah, so this would be another uh, case for this. Is let's say you have a 400 gigabyte file on a, 400, on a 500 gigabyte hard drive. You can't decompress it all, but you want to like, do word count on that file. So you could just uh, decompress it on the fly. It's not going to save it anywhere on disk. Uh, and then pass it to work count. And so then everything stays in memory. Uh, so there's this sort of quirky uh, command called uh, xargs. Uh, and I'm not going to go into full deal details, but it's a very powerful command. We're just going to make use of it in, in a very basic manner. So let's just do uh, cat a.txt. And we notice how um, it has a whole bunch of words on a line. It has a whole bunch of lines. But if we do uh, cat a.txt, and if we pass it to xr, um, essentially it, it takes uh, each individual word and puts it on one line. But what XORG actually does is it takes um, a whole bunch of uh, words and it reformats it to, um, to be passed as, a, as a arguments to another program. Uh, but you can specify how many arguments to chunk it up by. So if you do XORG-N2, it's going to break it up into, uh, uh, into uh, lines which has two arguments on each line. And if you do xr dash n, it just breaks up word word by word. And, and so we can do this. And then, well, there's a command called sort. And it does exactly what you think it does, is it will sort the uh, lines. And uh, it will be sorted. Uh, it keeps the duplicates in there. There's a way to drop all the duplicates. Uh, but there's also a way of, uh, there's another way of getting like unique names. And you can pass it to unique, to extract like unique lines. And so it does a line by line comparison. Uh, unique has to take sorted input. Uh, if you, because it only compares like adjacent lines. Uh, so you have to sort something first and then pass it to unique. And so you notice how uh, there's no duplicates of that anymore. But you can also tell Unique to uh, do a, a count. Uh, 
of how many uh, occurred in each file. So, um, so I did this command uh, where I took uh, the complete works of, uh, or the book, uh, Pride and Prejudice. I took it to the same command, I sorted it, I uh, got the unique uh, word counts uh, with, um, uh, with each word. And then I sorted it again, uh, because you notice how the, the word counts, uh, if I sort it again, what I can do is I can have it sorted by the most frequent words. And I have to give it the dash N to say that I want to sort it numerically, and then R for reverse. And it'll put the most uh, frequent words at the top, and then I can just give it to head, and it'll give me a list of, say, the <coughs> 10 most frequent words that occurred in this text file. Uh, this command actually takes a bit long, like maybe uh, 30 seconds or a minute to execute. There's a much faster way of getting uh, a word count um, if you are a dedicated program to do that. Uh, but it's just, if you just need to do it quickly, uh, uh, that's something that you can do. Uh, you could run that if you wanted. It will just take a little, a little while and maybe do it in the background. Um, yeah, so I think I had an example of uh, an access log from Apache. Yeah, so this is an access log by Apache. And so let's say we wanted to just get um, uh, the IP addresses from this. Uh, so we could just do the cut command again, but then we only wanted, uh, let's say we wanted like all the unique IP addresses. And so what we could do is we can do, um, I, I always use cat all the time just to like get all the contents of a file. Uh, it's, it's not necessary. Uh, you can give the file as an argument to the first command that you're going to use anyways. But if I just do the cat uh, access log, and if I pass it to, again, this cut command, because it has all this other stuff in here that we don't want. We don't want to have uh, the, the thing that we retrieve. Um, we can give it the delimiter. And so in this case, it's delimited by spaces. Uh, and then we can just pass it to cut. Oh, I forgot to give it the field. F1. And then I think, yeah, if I wanted uh, the timestamps, uh, you notice how there's this one space, so count like column one, column two, column three, column four. So if I took columns mm -hmm. four and five out of this, then I, I would get the timestamps. Four or five. Okay. And then again, we can do the same thing where we can pass this through sort and then unique, and then we'd have all the unique icons. IP addresses, and then you can also get a count of how many times each IP address uh, made a request to the server. Um, so something else that's handy is sometimes uh, you're going to uh, run a program that's going to generate output. You want it to save it to disk, but at the same time you also want to see what's going on like on the screen. So. Uh, I do this fairly regularly for like if I have a benchmark that's supposed to take like hours and hours, but it prints it up like something off the screen every five or ten seconds. And so the command that you want to do, we can just take our last command, add something else, and it's called a T command. And so T, uh, it takes uh, an argument and it's the file name. And so uh, say time. <laughs> so what T does is it redirects the output to the screen and at the same time writes it to the file. So if I see what was in this timestamp.txt, it's the exact same thing that just got printed out. Okay, so then I guess for the last 10 or 15 minutes or so, we'll talk about working with uh, remote machines. Does anybody have questions at all on anything? Oh, uh, those are the columns of the fields. So uh, what I did is, so we have 
this is actually one line. And I gave it to the limiter saying, I want to say, every time you encounter a space, it's going to start a new column. And so the IP address is one column, and then I have a space, so I start column two, which would just be the stash. And then I have another space, and this is column three, another space, and this is column four. And so with cut columns and fields, they're, they're the same thing. So a field, just think of as a column group. So I told it uh, F for field, three comma four, because I want column three, sorry, col col column four and column five. And in the first example, I just got the IP addresses. I just said I wanted column one. In, in a large code base, it's actually faster than going through an IDE and having to load up all your files. Uh, what you can type <coughs> is um, grep. Uh, the thing that you're looking for, um, so I want to look for 16, oh my, let's be 1610. And then the file name, uh, timestamps.txt. Uh, so let's yeah, so you can yeah you can you can uh, feed it input from from another program also. Um, uh, what you can also do uh, instead of another one. Uh, oh yeah, I did have this. Uh, so you can actually uh, give grep multiple files, or you can feed it input. Uh, you can also have display line numbers. So let's do grep. The word here. You don't always need uh, quotation marks, especially use quotation marks if you're going to use like strange characters. Um, let's see, you can use the dash n uh, to specify line numbers. Uh, so we'll do so we grab the word very. I'll put in quotation marks very. Then the Jane Austen dot txt, and it, it might be lost. So I'm just going to pass it ahead. And so it's going to give me like the nine. The live numbers were very occurred. Um, what else? <coughs> uh, so what you could do also is, if you wanted to recursively search through all the files in a directory, uh, you could do grep-r-n dash dash and then give the current directory. It'll look through like every single file that's in the current directory and um, Put out the results with the file names and the line numbers. Minus B is useful. What's that? Minus B. Oh, yeah, is that for verbose? No, it, it means omit. So anything that oh, doesn't yeah. match yeah, yeah. all the lines that don't have uh, a certain pattern. Let's see. So, how many sentences do not? Yeah, so what we could do is count how many times the word the does not occur in the line. So, grab the. In Austin TXT and do a word count. Oops. Word count dash L. Yeah, so we can say that there's 8,000 lines approximately that do not contain the word. Yeah, although well in this case, we also find things like there and other. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, you're anything. right. So if you wanted to just find the word the standalone, it's the minus W. So uh, yeah. the man page for Grub is going to tell you way more than he can tell you in you know, just a few minutes here. So. Yeah. So <laughs> w is really useful. Yeah, W is, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, let's see, we have about 15 minutes left. So in the last 15 minutes, uh, I'll talk about working with remote machines. Uh, that should only take about 10 minutes, and then uh, we can uh, go to some questions if you want. Maybe. So, uh, so working with a remote machine, 
it's just like working in the terminal, but it's a terminal on, on a different machine. So you can, you should all have an account on Oak. So type SSH, uh, your username. You can omit the username if the username that you're currently logged into is the same as the one that you're going to log into on, on the remote machine. But do oak.fast.sfg.ca. And the first time you connect to a machine, it's going to ask you for a free print. SSH is very secure. Uh, if you're using uh, file transfers, don't use FTP. Never use FTP. Uh, FTP uh, actually sends your password in plain text. And so if I was sitting on uh, this network with a, with a packet snooper, and if you were to type in your, your password onto FTP, I can just read your, your, your password in plain text. Your username and password sent, get sent over plain text with FTP. So you always want to use either secure FTP or uh, SCP for secure, secure ball talk. And one of the reasons why it's secure is it does this handshake where the first time you connect, it gets um, this fingerprint of the machine. And even if, um, so what happens is, uh, let's say somebody uh, spoofs this domain name and they take this domain name, they hijack it, and then have it redirected to a different machine. Uh, SSH will tell you that, uh, that the machine's like, physical ID has changed. Uh, but the very first time, it, it, it can't have an idea. So the very first time, you, you have to trust it and say it's going to add this machine's uh, key into, uh, <coughs> into the machines that it knows about. If you have trouble logging into Oak, um, what you should do, do is just look on like the machine next to you, look at its name, and you should be able to do like this one here is like Nectarine. Uh, so you should be able to do SSH Nectarine dot I think look up where Oak is. I'm not sure. Uh, 
see what you have. Okay. So what I want to do is I just want to type oak because oak dash all that other stuff is too long. What you can do is you can uh, edit uh, your ssh dot config file. So you can do gedit your home directory no. ssh config. I'll bring up your little window. I'm not using like the or anything. So no, I just I just do this. Uh, what you can do is uh, type post oak. So this is going to be the shortcut. And then uh, post name is oak.fast.sl.ca. <coughs> and now I can just do SSH oak. Okay, and it allows me to use that shortcut. Uh, you can also give it like a pattern. Like if you have a whole bunch of computers that were dot fast or sfu.ca, there's a way to just do like a substitution. I think you put a star and then a dash. Uh, if you want to know more about that, I can send you uh, a link with further instructions. But it, it's great if you have to connect to a lot of different machines that have a bunch of different domains, but they're all on the same uh, subnet. Uh, copy a file, uh, there's SCP, so secure copy. So the way it works is you give it the source. Uh, let's say I'm going to copy that Jane Austen TXT, and I'm going to copy it to my oak. Uh, machine and I just do both two colons and I cross it over there. So when I SSH to uh, oak again, then it's, it's there. So also the infrastructure, so let's say I removed uh, the Jane Austen.txt, and do SF. I think sometimes SCP, if you have a second connection already established to the server, uh, SCP will do some tricky things where uh, it'll allow tab completion, even though that you're not connected. So long as you have another connection that's open, I, I don't know how it works exactly. Okay, so the last thing about working with remote machines that's handy, uh, especially if you're working over a um, uh, connection that's um, not to uh, uh, what's the word? Um, stable. Uh, so let's say I'm working on my laptop uh, in an internet cafe, and I need to start an experiment uh, on this machine, and it's going to take a day to run. Uh, if I just start it right now, uh, I, I'd have to stay in the in the wireless cafe, like with my laptop, because as soon as I uh, disconnect, it's going to close uh, this uh, this window that I'm in, and it's going to disconnect.